you all uh, get to witness a little bit of discussion today. Our lectures in the past were not the most popular part of the program, and I wanted to use the excuse to maybe get some comments from our presenters. Uh, you see them in their presentations. You don't see them interacting with each other. Uh, and one of the ideas behind SWORDFAST was to get people together to approach the sword from sort of different directions and different traditions. Um, so with that said, rather than my attempting an introduction of each of the people here, we do have represented by choreography, the new discipline of lightsaber, the um, historic fighting of the Palmetto Knights, and 19th century saber is one of the enthusiasms um, of my colleague, our curator of history. Uh, but the truth is that no one of these four is described by a single style, uh, but by having quite a bit of background in different styles of swordsmanship. From, so my first question to you, to evade the responsibility of an introduction, <laughs> is uh, to say, if you please give your name for the camera, and what kind of a swordsman do you consider yourself? Uh, what, what is your tradition and background that you represent? Oh, You're first. going down here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Alan Dodson. I consider myself to be a poor swordsman. There. <laughs> 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 no, um, no I, I have a background in historic martial arts and uh, stage combat. Um, I've been doing various swordy things since about 2000, 2001 is about when I got started. Uh, I've done sport fencing, I've done stage fighting, I've done a whole bunch of Renaissance era fencing, medieval fencing, um, and try and incorporate that into theater and film as well. I'm a screenwriter as well, um, do a lot of writing work, and um, so yeah, just anything that involves bludgeoning, just all the things. <laughs> yeah, hi, my name's Tony Nayron, um, retired ROTC instructor, so. Mostly my title is commander, so I'm not sensei or any of the other titles I go with. I just go by commander, and that stayed with me when I retired. Um, a background of four years of Olympic saber fencing in college. Uh, when I retired from JROTC, I wanted to keep on teaching mostly teenagers and above, and so we started the uh, we started with lightsabers. So I run the Aiken uh, Saber Academy. We don't call them lightsabers because lightsaber term is owned by Disney, so we stay away from that, we just call them sabers. But for here, I don't see Mickey Mouse sitting out there, we'll just call them sabers. Um, it's, a, it's a generalized sport that is borrowed from all disciplines sitting here. So historical European, kendo, other Asian arts like that. Hi, I'm Larry Lanesse, and my, what I'm involved in, Pulmonary Nights, is primarily Bohurt which is a reintroduction of a medieval sport that is now a modern sport of being a hill hitchhiker and equipment like this. Uh, my experience with sword fighting, I played with sword-like objects in a competitive sport-like way since at least 2005 or so. And um, through the evolution of those concepts, uh, got more into like, if you want to pick a sword style like, it's gonna be Fiore love studying Fiore, which is a 14th century, very arrogant Italian. So, super fun <laughs> guy to read. <laughs> uh, Fiore, Fiore is a great one. Yes. Um, ben Batiste, I am the curator of history and archives here at the museum, and I have been studying sword, playing with sword, and doing martial arts for years and years and years, probably going back to my early teen years. And as a swordsman, I wouldn't say there's any specific style, although I've studied some Fiore, I have uh, studied various saber manuals, and my love is definitely in the medieval period. Thank you. So, uh, because I think it applies to a lot of people in the room, maybe, uh, somebody who is interested, uh, and you don't have to do this in a particular order, um, uh, and not everybody has to answer every question. Uh, but if somebody is interested in beginning getting into sword play, uh, what would you say, should, where should they start? 
what's a good way to start? Um, in my opinion, a uh, quick best way to get into any form of sword fighting is go grab a broom and try and hit your friend. <laughs> um, so that's the one of the best ways to do it. Uh, the museum does not endorse. <laughs> <laughs> but so, we do. <laughs> uh, yeah, you asked us, not the museum. Uh, so, no, when it comes down to it, is nowadays with the social media and all those things, you pick whatever generic topic you're looking for. Like if you type in sword fighting on Facebook, you will find a group. And that group is more likely going to have some type of locator to find the nearby club or whatever it is around you. Um, you can type in sword fighting, type in saber, any of those things in the Facebook, Google, etc. You will find a way to get involved in that sense. Um, go to the closest local. I strongly recommend finding something that's established first versus going to someone's backyard. Uh, there's a distinct difference on what you're going to encounter in those environments. I find it to be a, there's a lot of backyard things that aren't the greatest of environments to run into is a good way to phrase it. Uh, Anybody want to elaborate on that one? Yeah, I will. So uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, it's really difficult if you're a novice to start off and learn safely. So there are people getting hurt who see things on television or in the media and then try to duplicate it. So you're always best finding an expert to teach you. If you are young, like these young guys, there are ample opportunities in, in traditional martial arts to learn defense with weapons. If you're a little bit older, there are more opportunities to actually learn the things that these guys do with the heavier bladed weapons. Uh, lightsabers do. Uh, there aren't a lot of schools throughout the country, but there are a lot of groups who teach it, but you have to be a certain age. So you have to be, in most of those groups, you have to be at least 16 and older before they'll allow you to participate as a group. But the best answer is to find where the expertise is, go to the expertise, and learn properly. Well, we pulled a lot of expertise into this building today. <laughs> well, yeah, kind of like what they said. It's, um, I also, you know, if... If you can't find anything sword related that fits you, like you said, traditional martial arts, you get into wrestling and you just anything that allows you to be comfortable with using your body in space in relation to an uncooperative opponent is always good. Now from a stage combat, if you're looking to do stuff for like film or theater and stuff like that, obviously you start getting involved in any kind of theater productions and through that there will be instances where you'll learn how to do something like learn how to slap somebody without hurting them or not slap somebody and pretend like you're hurting them or, and things like that, you'll gradually get that. There's a group called the, uh, the Society of American Fight Directors and when you get a little bit older, they offer classes and stuff like that on how to get trained and those type of things. If you're really looking to do all the type of stuff, there's the United Stuntsmen Association um, who also will start teaching people, I think, out of high school. From the stage aspect, you know, get go ahead and get involved with the theater, learn how to use your body, and um, go go for that route. So. And I want to chime in on a thing: the like the stage fighting lessons I've received from Alan increase my ability to do sword fighting in general, because there is a an additional level of skill needed and a different style of skill that taught me better how to do some of the body mechanics that I was trying to refine and get better at. So, just because it's not actually fighting, it absolutely helps. Like, I mean, all this helps. You should play everything. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. Um, and just as Alan was saying, with uh, getting involved with any kind of martial art, anything you learn like that is going to help you do anything else. So, learning body, proper body mechanics, learning how to move your own body, all of that stuff's really gonna help you out. Um, sorry, it triggered it, so it's coming out anyway. Uh, so, super fun thing. So we're studying. We have a, an, we have people who are actively studying judo, and they're like, "This is an Asotogari. This is how you do an Asotogari." They're doing all this, and then my crew of people walked over, which we've never studied judo, but we studied fiore, and we all were like, "Oh, foo!" Like this, and they're like, "You guys all know this already." Like, yeah, it's play number four in fiore. So, Japanese, right? Judo's Japanese, basically? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, 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 I was like, Japanese? I was screwed up and I just screwed up. So, Japanese culture developed a way to throw a guy. 
the Italian culture, Joel's the way to throw a guy, and it's exactly the same thing, you know. Human bodies are the same yeah. all across the world. You're going to notice Skills there's a skill. lot of cross-pollination of ideas where there was really no cross-pollination, so it's just body mechanics. Yeah, so it's a neat thing to notice. Uh, in, in my opinion, maybe the oldest debate in sword design is straight or curved better? Don't give your boring answer. <laughs> what's my boring answer? <laughs> your boring answer is like, what's the mission? Well, yeah, the context <laughs> is everything, right? Right. Don't no, give I'll that say one. straight. I always say straight. Uh, straight gives you so many more options. Um, with most straight blades, both sides were sharp. And so you can use both sides for a variety of techniques when you have a curved blade. Typically only one side is sharp. Now sometimes you'll have curved blades where like the top fourth or the top third on the back side is also sharp. That can help. Um, there are a few nifty things that you can do with a curved blade that you can't do um, with a straight blade. It also depends if you're mounted. Cavalry, if you're on a horse, some of the mechanics of having a curved blade can help. But uh, yeah, I've my life were on the line, I'd take a straight blade any day. It's yeah. just so many. It's just much more diverse. Uh, I, I, to I totally agree. If you uh, curved blades are great for cutting off a of horseback, you're generating force in one direction. Uh, you could take a straight blade though, and you can move it in, in different directions, and it's more versatile weapon. Uh, curved blades a little bit more difficult to make contact and do a proper strike with the point. Where points on a straight blade are so much, so much easier. It's a counterpoint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when it comes to the idea of the curved blade, uh, it's my choice. Uh, mainly, it's my choice more because of the cultural history interest that I have, which is mostly Eastern Mongol things like that. So I'm a bigger fan of those type of wide blades and stuff like that. And most of those are all curved. Um, they're right. But you can learn to use curved blades in really interesting ways, and people who only fight straight blades can be tricked and confused by the tricks that you can do in curved blades, the way that the angles of strikes come in, that changes the dynamic of how the strikes and patterns move. That is correct. I'm a straight blade person, though. The, the angles do change up when you have a curved blade, but the real strength of the curved blade, I would say, is in the cut. When you have a curved blade, you can do a drawing cut across your target, and if you have an unarmored target, that's going to be much more devastating than a straight blade cut where you're going to hack into something, and then you actually have to physically pull the blade to do a good cut. The problem is, if the straight blade is fully capable of cutting an unarmored target, just as a curved blade is, and once you have an armored target in something like this, a curved blade is a detriment. It's really hard to find the chinks in the armor when you have a curved blade. A straight blade is much easier to get into places and stab with. So I would say the straight blade is the more versatile tool. And when you all walked out of here, walked right across the way uh, to the Plowshares to Swords exhibit, and you'll see that the guy who bought the swords for his cavalry at his own expense, Wayne Hampton, had a strong, unusual for the 19th century opinion, he wanted a straight double-edged blade. So did the young officer who redesigned the U.S. Army Sabre in the early 1900s, uh, a fellow by the name of George Patton. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for, for that one. Um, and I'm gonna ask Alan to answer this one last. Okay, fair enough. Because it intrudes on his area of specialty, perhaps, more than the others. Um, what's your pet peeve in sword fights in the movies or on stage? I mean, so many How much time do you have? Don't go past your top two pet peeves at the most. And we can't repeat each other. Saying this is unfortunate. Yeah, Ben's first. Now it's it makes it hard. <laughs> we can't repeat each other. We can't go past the top two. Ben's first. No, we have to not repeat each other because that we'll all be boring and just repeat each other. Okay, so, all right, so all right. I'm only going to do one. The thing that I'm wearing it, people stabbing people through armor. You'll see it, the, they're, the guys in the armor are fighting, and then somebody runs the guy through with a sword. That's never going to happen. That is such a critical failure of your armor. Maybe, just maybe, the 
point pierces through and you get in and the guy dies, he'll bleed out. It's not going to come through the guy's back. There's another plate back there. That's going to catch it. You're not going to have two failures in a straight line. It will not happen. Armor is worn because it's effective. No one would wear all this weight if it wasn't effective and didn't stop blows. Um, mine's going to actually relate to armor also, but in a different way is usually in most movies you see either the guy moving around like the armor doesn't even exist and he's super agile ninja guy or you see the guy moving around and it looks like he's a juggernaut and he can barely walk both of those are wrong uh you can pretty much like most people can do anything they can do out of armor they can do in armor it's very rare that you can't do both um different people's skill sets different abilities like we actually do a thing, uh, who is it, Christine and um, Sam. They're both skilled swing dancers. They will wear their full suits of armor and do a full swing dance routine, aerials and everything, <laughs> you know, in full suits of armor, no problem. Uh, Sam and a few of the other guys will do the uh, Dark Souls dive rolls, you know, the diving rolls and armor, somersaults, and do all that all around and hop up do cartwheels and all sorts of stuff. We even have guys who can do flips in armor. Um, but they can't, like, bounce around like a ninja off the walls type stuff. They're not, can't do that. But they can do <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, yeah, for me, it's, the, it's lazy choreography. When I watch the, the flight choreography, I, I can see that I, it's, they're not even attempting to make it look real. And this goes back even to the Earl Flynn movies from the 30s and 40s with Basil Rathbone, they're fighting with rapiers, and they're not striking at each other, they're striking at each other's blades, and they're making a lot of noise, but, it looks good. but it, it's, it's <laughs> terrible choreography, and don't get me started on the Star Wars choreography, um, it, it's awful, I mean, so they're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, it looks great, but it's obvious choreography, so they, they need to do, they need to improve it and make it look a little bit more realistic, while still jumping around is with the force or being on wires if you're watching Asian uh, Chinese stuff but make it look a little better than it is lazy choreography drives me drives me absolutely nuts all right well um, I'll quick hit a couple of um, the, the perception that swords are extremely heavy is, is a big one you'll see a lot in movies you'll see people hefting swords around as if they weighed 15, 20, 30 pounds, and usually most of them weighed about two to three and a half pounds, somewhere in that range. Uh, real, um, real quick commentary, when, yeah. when we have all our weapons upstairs at two o'clock and stuff, we'll let you guys pick them up. Almost all those weapons weigh more than the historic weapons do. Yeah, so, yeah the historic on. weapons were actually quite light. And um, and the, along, kind of along with that, Another pet peeve is, is weapons doing things that they were never intended to do or physically can't do, like cut through concrete, uh, SUVs, um, chopping down trees and, th and things like that. That's always uh, a, a facepalm moment where you see that type of stuff occurring. So that's only Katanas that do that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the magical Katanas. Katanas. Yeah, they, they, they. <laughs> Since we're talking about your pet peeves, could you each share your most favorite cinematic sword play, uh, I guess. Ooh, let's make this even one. harder. We're not allowed to say the same one. Keep going. Keep going. Because right. right. <laughs> right. that's going to be challenging. I know we're like three of us are definitely yeah. going, yeah. and yeah. one of us is going to say it, and yeah. it's going to ruin it for the rest of us. <laughs> what should we study if we see something good? All right. Who wants to start? We gave you a really hard one starting on my end. We can keep it yeah. starting. All right. Okay. My favorite is Rob Roy. Oh, thank um, God. Okay. <laughs> That's a good one, buddy. No, you, you grabbed <laughs> mine. You didn't take me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, Rob Roy, is, uh, it's a, they, the, the sword fighting throughout is very, is about as accurate as you'll get. There's a, I have a top three of most accurate, most well done sword fighting in movies. Um, the, the fight between Liam Neeson and um, Tim Roth. At the very end, especially, is, is really, really spectacular. Really well done. Not without its theatrical embellishments, but it is for entertainment. Uh, but that one is right near the top of my list of, of best sword duel in cinema. Mine is uh, Princess Bride. 
So this was the one yeah. I was expecting. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> the See, I didn't know we, we, we all just, were going to. That was on my list. <laughs> just for for entertainment, uh, I really enjoyed it. It was it was a great fencing. No, but was it fun to watch? Yes. It was a beautifully done. Yeah. 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 yeah beautiful choreography. Um. So. And I'm saying this one because it's fresh in my head, and I enjoyed it because they actually did a couple of things better than almost every movie I've seen do. And of course they did this because they actually had, oh wait, people like me and him in the film. So uh, that's The Last Duel and The King. Both those movies have recently come out. Both those movies had m a large number of Bohurt fighters in it and a hired to be um, advisors. So except on the armor. Hmm? Except, except on the, the armor. armor. They screwed the, screw the armor. The armor's totally uh, but, so bad. But yes, but that <laughs> last fight scene and the, the way the armor side. was treated. Yeah. Um, it so, actually deflected blows. Yeah, yeah, like in the last duel, the two guys, while it would have been better if they had full proper helms and they had to smash the, the helm open like it actually happened yeah. in the historic references. But the idea of how they were striking each other repeatedly and having to deal with each other's armor. Like, they were fighting each other's armor more than they were fighting each other in the last duel, and that was a really neat segment. I'm not recommending watching the movie as a whole, but the last <laughs> whole segment is really neat. Um, just the way they do all those fight sequences. I was really impressed with that, and the idea that it brought, like, it was as close, like, it was close enough to what it should have looked like in my eyes, at least, that I was really happy about it. Yeah, it was a lot rougher that last thing, a lot rougher than I expected it to be. It yeah. Sort of well, deal. I mean, it we've had nice fights thing. that are that rough other than we don't try to kill each other. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> I set myself up for this. Um, yeah, you did. It's real hard now. <laughs> I think it was James Cameron's The Duelist. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. 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 That is yep. easy. <laughs> The other one. That is probably <laughs> that was on my the list best too. saber combat you will ever see. And on small film. sword. Oh. Hmm? And small and sword. small sword. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Oh. Small sword and saber. Yeah. Are phenomenal on that. It's done in a 17th century style and top notch. What's the name? What's the, the duelist. duelist. The Harvey duelist. Keitel and who's the other guy? He's famous too. Yeah. They're yeah. both famous to this yeah, day. Yeah, it's like late 17th century, early yeah. 18th century style fighting, and they're phenomenal. Yeah. Also got to throw it out there, it's almost impossible to find the right version of it in America. Um, shoot. The guy who was Aragorn in Lord of the Rings. Oh, Alatriste. Alatriste. Uh, Viggo Mortensen. Yes. That has some amazing... Spanish rapier. Uh, yeah. It's phenomenal work, yeah. Also, they're really good in their battle sequences, too, in general. Like, the scale of battle is beautiful stuff. So you can We run into the problem of mission. <laughs> <laughs> One we were, weapon for all comers? Yeah. This blind, you're going to be fighting. What do you grab? Don't know who or what or how. Can I go first? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah. Spear. Nice. <laughs> Range map. <laughs> I'll see your spear and I'll raise you pole axe. <laughs> <laughs> now I have a spear, I have an axe, and I have a hammer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I had to pick. It's close to what they do. It's a Najinata from Japan. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, a good one. it's a pole with a sword See, on the end. You should have said lightsaber because all yeah. our weapons are worthless. <laughs> <right. laughs> <laughs> just saying. But they have just come out with a lightsaber Najinata and named it after him. Uh, uh, yeah, there you go. So, uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll stick with the swords. I'll, I, I really like basket hilts. Uh, the basket hilt broadsword um, is one of my favorites. I love it. It's very versatile. Great hand protection, things getting close, you can bop people in the nose with that little armored fist there and do some dental work for them for free. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I love the broadsword. I've got a couple of good uh, questions from the group. I have one more, it's more of a silly one, okay. but to our um, lightsaber um, guy, would yep. you consider your craft the oldest since the scroll? The movie says a long <laughs> <laughs> oh, by, by far, by nice. far, yeah, the, just like me, I'm the oldest up here. Yeah, it's the oldest sport. Now, it's actually a newest sport in, in France. It's a national sport. So they've made it the equivalent of Epe and Foil. They just put it in the Paris Olympics. 
right. Oh, yeah. That's what I heard. Oh, and cool. it'll be it'll be the actually the only one the fencing that people will actually watch. Yeah. Yep. No one will yep. actually watch any of those. Valid. You know, watch that because people fly the in the French version of it. I don't know why. Which we which we <laughs> teach the style of it. We we borrowed that to create our own, but we've also borrowed it from uh, a style from England, and we've combined them into one one thing that we teach at Aiken Saber because we want the kids not to wear that and fly. That that's expensive. So we want to create a a, a a sport that is fast and quick, and that anybody can learn. That is that is a, that's a lifestyle. That's that's an amazing sport, but it's an expensive sport. Or just time consuming. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 you can save on the expense and make your own. <coughs> no, but it's still expensive. I. Nearly as expensive. So, um, I, I'm going to close out with a bit of a thought question. Uh, and I really have appreciated you all allowing yourselves to be dragged in here to ask, answer some of these questions today. Uh, but since I know we have people that are going to want to pursue some of these things, further, um, what is probably the most important attribute in a sword student, and what should a student look for in a teacher? You want me to go first? Sure. So the most important part in a student is the determination to learn. It's that simple. Uh, if they're determined to learn, they'll show up to class, they will actually listen. Uh, for a teacher, you're looking for somebody who's com who's compassionate and can communicate with their students. If they don't, if they're distanced from their students, or if it's my way or the highway, and they're not flexible, then that's a poor teacher. And that goes for every every martial art, or frankly, for every sport. So that's what you're looking for. <laughs> you all don't have to disagree with this. I don't think this one. Anybody add to that? Uh, just saying, you know, for a student, you know, you got to be teachable. You yeah. have to be willing to be taught. A lot of times, and surprise, in the martial arts community, people come in thinking that they know how to do everything and know how to do it better. And sometimes that creeps into teaching as well. Sometimes as teachers and instructors, you need to remember that there is always more that you can learn, always ways that you can adapt and change and do things better. Um, if anything, we learn from our studies in, in historic martial arts is that the, from armor to weapons to how they were taught was a constantly evolving process where one informed the other, the experience was informed how they taught, and it's just, it was always, always moving. It's never stay static. If stay static, then you get beat. Um, and then even in, in stage combat, because you have to change. A lot of martial artists who come over in stage combat have a really hard time adapting because they're so bent on, this is how I correctly throw a punch. And you know, you have to say, no, you have to throw it at a different angle because the camera doesn't see it at that angle and it's at a low point. So when you actually throw it correctly, it looks like you're hitting the guy in the neck, but the story says you need to hit the guy in the head. So you need to change. And if people can't adapt to that, then they do not, they're not successful. So being humble and teachable. And then with an instructor, you should never feel like they are belittling you or insulting you, pushing you, pushing you to do better, helping you to do better but never degrading you. You want to watch out for that. Yeah, I pretty much agree on everything both of them said. Uh, the big thing with students is the student, they need to, like for example, when Alan was like, here's stage fighting stuff, I immediately became dumb and knew nothing. So Alan could show me stage fighting stuff. And like he had a whole segment he needed with a group of us to do. All of us just went stupid and said, okay, what do you want? You know, like, and we learned what he had to tell us. Even though we knew things, we did what he said. The ability to be willing to do that and not, uh, for example, like if we're going over something, like I've gone to his school to teach longsword. His students listened and learned longsword. They didn't go, but lightsaber, I do this. They went, I'm learning longsword now because I'm in a longsword class. Um, the ability to switch and do what you're being taught is huge uh, and we tend to get a lot of individuals who come in and I'm gonna say their ego is too important for them uh, and it makes it hard to teach them and it's good to be confident in yourself but there's a limit but it's the only thing I can add to that 
Alright, well, I guess I can add to what you said. So, um, <laughs> while, yes, you need to envelop the student's mind when, you, when it's time to learn, there's also nothing wrong if you have learned something else afterward when we're not in teacher-student relationship time, you can bring that forward and say, hey, have you, what about this? That there's per, there are times where it's perfectly fine to question and ask why. Yes. Not when you're learning the how, though. Wait until you've learned that how, and now you can ask why. Thank you very much indeed. I thought there was another interesting question that was on your list. There right. was another question on my list, wasn't it? And uh, wasn't it, what is the advantage, importance of sparring oh, compared yeah. to other kinds of training? Well, that's what it was. Or the uh, was that, or did you were you going to teacher and student fighting each other? Um, there was. I don't remember that was okay. a few days ago. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Too many headshots. Uh, say yours again. Sorry. Uh, uh, what is the importance or advantage of sparring as compared to other kinds of training for the sort, say, solo forms or getting lapel? Maybe want to go first. Uh, nothing duplicates the scenario of an uncooperative opponent um, doing drills, doing hitting a dummy, um, doing shadow boxing, or you know whatever. None of that compares with somebody actively trying to do something to you that you don't want, and vice versa. Um, that that scenario creates completely weird stuff always happens in fights that never fits into your training and you just got to learn how to deal with that it's and it's never going to be exactly the way it was so the more familiar you are with that stress of um, I don't know what's going to happen next the more comfortable you'll, you'll be um, in, in those situations whether it's competition or preparing for self-defense to me, the sparring is the culmination of good training. So if you're not trained and you just spar, there's a possibility of injury or just developing bad habits. Sparring is an important part where you adapt and overcome after learning and getting proper training, and, and it's critical. And so, uh, and that everybody should spar, even the instructor. Yeah, this, the instructor can't stay relevant if they're not sparring. And so you see these places where you get an inscrutable master instructor who <laughs> smiles at you and will never spar with them, with his students. He won't lower himself. Well, I don't think that's, and, th and that happens a lot in Asian arts. Um, I think he's depriving the students. I don't take it easy on my students. Um, they they can they now are at the point where they they beat me on a regular basis, and I don't have the ego to care much. It's, but I don't make it easy on them. Now, if it's a brand new student, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll let him school, or I'll generally let him lose too. But he won't lose by much. But like my night back there, I don't take it easy on him. And and when he wins, it's the sparring that is the result of good training that allowed him to beat the master instructor. And it's it's an important ingredient of the entire process. Yeah. Pretty much agree with most everything they've said before in that in those circumstances. Um, variations of it, I guess, would be the only way to go for that. Is it's so if you can't do it in training, even if it is just a dummy who's like a person who's just standing still and going with what you want to do, if you can't get the movement correct, then you will never get it correct in a fight and in turn in a fight you might never get that movement but you'll get a movement that's like that movement and that's the thing that people get caught up in is there's dead set in I have to do an overhaul with a search trial period and not actually do like it's like those things happen in the moment and you shift and adjust as they happen so you need the sparring to give you the dynamic of what's happening. But I feel that sparring is important, but it's the last thing, not the first thing. That's very similar to what he was saying. Um, and then those perspectives. But the biggest thing is learning the skill completely and then bringing it to the sparring or bringing it to them fighting. And on the student-teacher relation, um, 
yes, student, if a teacher refuses to fight anyone, probably should leave. Like, it's understandable if they won't fight certain people, there might be some reason for it, there might be dynamics, etc. But if they were to refuse to fight at all, probably not a place you should be learning from. Because there's something else going on there. So. I think sparring is important for all of these reasons, but also it is a way to accelerate your learning. Because mm -hmm. while we learn from our techniques and learn from our training, we also learn from our mistakes. And there is no way to get more mistakes faster than to get up with somebody <laughs> who might show you that, hey, you thought you had that. No, you don't have that. <laughs> so as long as you don't have the ego that gets in the way to stop you from looking at your own mistake and saying, how can I be better? If you can get past that hurdle, you can learn so much faster by the real world experience or the simulated real world experience with some safety involved that you get with sparring. And you're making sure that we have that. Oh, we got a question. Um, if you could put, pick one movie, one book, or one video game, who would you like to be? What character mm -hmm. from this? Well, character or world? Those are different character. things. A character. Character you'd like to be. Mm. I got this right away. Link. Yes, yes. <laughs> I have been playing The Legend of Zelda since yes. I was 10, and I love that game series. And that's Can what we just read out uh, Legend of Zelda 2? <laughs> See, I, I like horror movies and horror video games and horror this, so no. <laughs> it always says no. really bad. <laughs> There's no character I want to be in any of the things I like to read, watch, and listen to. <laughs> uh, and I, I would be Ahsoka Tano, you know, for the uh, Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. And she is just really the epitome of cool. Yeah, that's much better than Luke Skywalker. I think. Completely. Yes. Well, nobody carries the panache of my favorite. I, my favorite character in all fiction is Obi Wan Kenobi. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's yes. What? Yes. You Obi Wan yes. Kenobi? Oh, I am. I am all about Obi. So no, I yeah, I'm a big huge Obi Wan. Fan. All right, all good. Folks, I believe Dan Bernardo's. I haven't seen him. I hope he's here. I do. Yeah, I do. At one o'clock. Um, thank you very much. If not, we'll teach a HEMA class or something. Yeah.